to hear that story. All right, back to your story. So really quick, let's pause on your timeline. And let's just say now we're in the mid 2000s. By that time, who were your favorite? What were your favorite films? And who are your favorite filmmakers by the mid 2000s, if you can even remember <clears throat> at that time? Well, at, at some point, and I'd always had this love of comedy, and I'd always just want to do comedy films. That's initially what I wanted to do. My shorts were comedy. The majority of my uh, commercials were comedy. And I really just wanted to, uh, to, to do co comedic films. And I'd written a number of comedic scripts, and I'd got an agent in L.A., and I took a bunch of meetings over this wacky script called Las Vegas. And I wanted to make that. And, uh, you know, that was the direction I thought I was going to head in. And at the time, of course, I was watching a lot of indie films. Um, it's such an amazing event to have Sundance here in our backyard. And I know you lived it and loved it this year. But I was going up there as early as 96. I've gone every single year since 96. One year I missed. I was in Australia. But otherwise, every year I've gone up there. And every year I've had this, like, uh, hope of getting in there. None of my films were finished in time, by the way. But uh, when I lived up at Sundance, uh, they have this private theater in Sundance. It's a really great screening room. And I think Believer played there this year. And I got to know the projectionist really well, a guy named Ron. I want to say Ron Hill. It's not Ron Hill. I forgot his name. Ron. Anyways, lovely guy. And he also was something of an alcoholic. So if I brought him a six pack of beer, he'd let me watch a movie in this theater. <laughs> so it's literally like Redford's private screening room with an, it's a theater, man. And he, and Redford has this, uh, Redford has this private collection of 35 millimeter prints. And I just go in like it was my own little movie, like my own private admission, store. six pack of beer. Totally. <laughs> and I would sit there by myself and I'd watch Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid, oh, wow. or, or or I'd watch, uh, you know, Meet Me in St. Louis, or I'd watch The Sting, or I'd watch, I mean, he had this amazing collection of great classic movies, and i just sit there by myself. Wait, you watch Sting in Robert Redford's private theater at, at Sundance? By myself. <laughs> just middle of the day while Ron was in there drinking course. That I brought down in. the yeah, it, was, it was amazing. It really was amazing to watch those films on the big screen. By the way, Butch Cass, Cassie and the Sundance Kid, I've seen it. I saw it twice on VHS. And then when I saw it on the big screen, completely different movie. I mean, Westerns shot with that 35 millimeter anamorphic, you know, and it starts so small, like that film starts small with like, uh, Butch and Sundance in the poker room, you remember? And uh, they're playing poker. And uh, and then it opens up and it shows them in the horse and it's this amazing, beautiful shot of I think it was the Utah desert, and it's just stunning. I mean, it just blew me away. And so that film became one of my favorites after seeing it on the big screen. If you get a chance to see it on the big screen, see it on the big screen. It doesn't end so well though. Well, not no. a very happy ending. No, no, <laughs> not really. Supposedly, uh, Sundance lived and moved back to Utah. That's the rumor. Harry Longbaugh. Okay, so a aspiring com comedy filmmaker is very different from how you ended up, which is a documentary filmmaker. And I can't help but think about someone who really deeply influenced me in the same time period, maybe a little bit before, which is Ken Burns. Yeah. So I learned about the Civil War documentary series. Once Netflix came out, I went back and watched Ken Burns's. Huey Long, his Brooklyn Bridge, uh, Thomas Jefferson, the Shakers. Yep. And then, you know, he followed, you know, Civil War up with baseball and jazz and, you know, uh, so many cool uh, yeah. documentaries. So, you know, how did you move from aspiring comedy filmmaker into documentary filmmaker? Yeah. And did Ken Burns have anything to do with it? Well, um, I mean, not, I, I watched baseball. I watched his entire baseball. I've probably seen that twice now. But uh, Oh, because you're a baseball fan. Oh, I'm a big baseball fan. Who's your I, team? I'm a Cubs fan. You're a Cubs fan. I've been a Cubs fan. So been last a, year, two last years ago two was your year. Last year was amazing. Last year, they're good. This year is going to be good. Uh-huh. Um, but I'm a, I've been a baseball fan Once my whole life. Once a century life. for you guys. Big. <laughs> Once a century. <laughs> big, That's all you guys get. Big baseball fan. And I'm obsessed with, um, oddly enough, uh, pre-1900s baseball. 1860s, 1870s. Really odd thing to study but I really love it um so yeah I saw the baseball the Ken Burns baseball 
And I like Ken Burns. Everyone likes Ken Burns. The film that really got me, the film that changed my life in many ways, was uh, War Room, which is about the 1992 campaign uh, with George Stephanopoulos. I saw that. Ger- it's so good. Clinton and Stephanopoulos. Yeah. And, and James like, Carville. When I was right? a kid. James Carville. Yeah. Yeah. The Rage and Cajun. And when I was a kid and I watched that, uh, I wasn't a kid. I was, you know, I was mid-20s, early mid-20s. And I mean, not only did that uh, open my eyes politically, and of course I'm very politically active now and very interested in politics, it, 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 it also made me want to be, or at least put a bug in my ear that documentaries are fantastic. And that, of course, was a very groundbreaking documentary. I watched it a few years ago. It doesn't hold up like it did then, but at the time, to have that access um, and to see something that you weren't allowed to see as it played out just blew my mind just to be able to be in there. And that's a very different film than like Ken Burns. Ken Burns, and I love Ken Burns, he's got, but his, his, his style hasn't changed. Yeah, like yeah. Baseball same Baseball is the same as Vietnam. Yep, yep. And, and, but when I was, you know, you, and that's, that's essentially at that time, that's what people thought documentaries were. You know, these slow moving, we're telling a story of a bridge, you know, or PBS kind of stories, right. And then to see this like fly on the wall verite experience of a campaign, a wildly run campaign, just blew my mind to see that and, and made me go, this is, this is storytelling. Like this is, to be able to be where people are, you're not allowed you know, to have that inside backstage access, that is the kind of thing, like, I wanted to do that. Like, I wanted to tell a story that allowed me to spend time with people. And so that's, um, that's really what kind of kickstarted me into wanting to make documentaries. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I was working up in Salt Lake. Uh, I was with uh, a, a company called Metropolis, and we were doing commercials still. I was doing commercials and directing commercials, and then I made Take, that film, and I said, I'm not going to do commercials anymore. And uh, I, I, uh, I, uh, a friend of mine, Jenny Lynn Merton, who was also here in Utah, uh, she had also left the faith. Uh, we went up to Sundance one day, and we saw a film. God, I can't remember what documentary it was. It's a great film. And I, we drove home and I was just like, God, I want to make a doc. We should just make a documentary. And two days later, she said, hey, here's a great idea about these kids who were kicked out of polygamy. And, um, and I was like, that's interesting. We should look into that. And we started to look into it and we kept working and we kept like we, we reached out to a a uh, uh, the, the the foundation that was helping these young kids and said we want to make a documentary. He's like, look, everyone wants to make a documentary on these lost boys. Uh, you know, to explain a little bit for those who don't know, in in uh, uh, southern Utah on the Arizona Utah border, there's a town called Colorado City. It's actually called Colorado City in Hilldale, and it was the home of the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Latter Day Saints, a, uh, a a fundamentalist group that practiced polygamy. And they were led by Warren Jeffs, who was the quote-unquote prophet of this entity. Very strict. They lived down the middle of nowhere. They uh, didn't have radio, music, TV, books. Obviously, they, they dressed very uh, pioneerish, and they kind of kept to themselves. Well, Warren Jeffs, after a while, started to rule with this iron fist. And they would routinely exile these young boys and they'd send these 14, 15, 16 year old boys who had no knowledge of the outside world, very little experience with what they knew outside of this small town. He just, they just kick them out. Cause they didn't, they didn't want too much competition for the women. I mean, if, that's, if there were going to be four or five women per man, you can't have all these men, single men running around competing for the women. Essentially. I mean, that's the mathematics of it. Uh, it, it, it's a little more than that in that like who's gonna which of these kids is going to be more like dad which is the one that's going to make money for this entity who's the one who's going to keep the most secrets um, who's the one who's going to uh, revere Warren Jeffs and do what he says and if they if they see that these kids who as little as like have a short sleeve shirt on or part their hair the wrong way they see that they're not going to be obedient. They'll kick them out and call the field. 
but in many ways it's pure mathematics. If you need to marry multiple wives in order to get into heaven, you need to get rid of some of those strapping young boys. So that story was happening, and at the time there were a number of filmmakers who wanted to tell this story. It was in the media, and bigger filmmakers than I, than Jenny and I. I hadn't made a documentary at this point, and Jenny, hell, Jenny was a, a, a English student at the U of U. But we decided to just make this, and we were damn determined to do it. And we, we were able to be persistent enough to finally meet these kids. And I remember one day we'd gone down there, and we were chatting with them. And much like my mission, I didn't go in with a camera, storming in, let me make a movie. I'm going to make this. I'm going to film this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm make this movie. Um, it was, I want to meet these people. I'm going to spend some time. I'm going to hang out with them. It was six months of ingraining myself and continually going back, continually going, continually going. And I remember we met some kids and they were telling us about uh, like what it was like growing up in this community. And they started singing a hymn. They were like, this is what our hymns were like. And they started singing a hymn. And then Jenny and I started singing along. I mean, it was a Mormon hymn. And right then they were like, these guys get it. They understand it. Now I've often said, and it's, you know, it's cliched, but if you're going to make a movie or you're going to write a book, your first one, write something you know. Do something you know because it makes it a little bit easier to, you know, to do something. And that was, in many ways, uh, our story writ large was to be able to tell the story of these kids who had left their faith um, and had been forced out of their faith. So uh, we just started filming these boys. And, well, we can get into that. Right? Okay, so um, for for the for the few who might be listening who actually aspire to be a documentary filmmaker, don't because because <laughs> you don't need competition. No more sharks in the tank. <laughs> no, doesn't like half of America want to be a documentary filmmaker? I mean, I think we've all had that impulse. <laughs> yeah, or at least and, I and, have. And the, the beauty is, is that the documentary world is is really um, welcoming. Like the people that come into the documentary world are lawyers and are people who work at NGOs and people who've never made a doc before and don't have any film interest. They just find an amazing story and they know they've got to tell it. Um, it's hard. I mean, I made a narrative and it, was, it wasn't even close to difficult, as difficult as making a doc. Docs are exhausting and tiring and it, it rewards the people who are persistent and passionate enough to be able to want to tell a story, a long story. So if there's anyone out there who wants to make a documentary, A, it's an amazing field. B, just know that it's extremely difficult. And C, you have to love it. Um, it's not by any means lucrative. You know, if I put half the time and effort into a startup that I put in into making films, I'd have a boat. So, uh, so yeah, so you're... You, you and Jenny decide you want to make this doc and you've got a topic that you semi know and love, but do you have funding at this point? Do you, how do you get a crew together? Like, how did you sort of get to the point where you could start shooting? Well, fortunately, I'd, uh, I'd been making enough money off my commercials. So you self-funded? Yeah. Sons yeah. of Perdition? Yeah. For, at least for to begin the with? first part, yeah. Um, so you, you know, pull together a crew of... Not crew, of, schmoo. Ah, so you would set up your camera. own camera and, Absolutely. and lighting I still do. and audio? I still do for the most part. Okay, yeah. so you would do your own cinematography. And that was for a number of reasons. A, um, it was because of finances. Uh, you know, we didn't want to hire someone to be there and have to film. I just did it myself. At the time, looking back, it was the best thing that could happen because it was I was able to be there without another person. Like... So the story essentially is we follow these three young boys who are kicked out and they'd just been kicked out of polygamy and we watched them and the, the film took two years. I mean, we followed them for two and a half years and during this two and a half years, we were with them. I mean, we were in the trenches. We stayed with them. We visited them. We watched them as they had success, as they had failures. We watched them miss their parents. We watched them as they tried to rescue their mothers and little sisters. And if anyone's seen the film, and if anyone hasn't, they can. It's it's no longer on Netflix. It's on a, I think it's on a Amazon Prime and other places, iTunes. I think it is on a Prime now. It's all over. It's it still plays all over the world. But um, 
like we were there like we were we were in the back seat while while a kid was trying to rescue his 15 year old sister from being married to a you know to an older man we were there when the cops showed up hell i was arrested in colorado city i was put in the back of a police squad police car and on the police car dashboard and i'm not kidding they had a picture of joseph smith and a picture of warren jeffs like right <laughs> next to each other in a cop car <laughs> so we lived it man we were in the trenches and i say this if you're going to make a film about vietnam or about war put on a flak jacket you know like don't be a part of the story ingrain yourself live it learn it know enough about these people and care about the people enough and we love these kids we took care of them how they lived with me they stayed with me we rescued a 14 year old girl literally from she was going to be married the next day to an older man you know, what happens in that community is uh, a, a girl will be told she's going to get married and it, it, it's different now but uh and then they, they'll literally pick her up, they'll take her to a hotel, they'll put her in one room, and they'll, they'll put a dress on her. And then the next room, they teach her about sex. They'll literally say, this is what sex is gonna be like for you, this is what's gonna happen. And then they take her to the next room, and they marry her to a 50, 60-year-old man who she probably hasn't even met. And then they go in the next room, and you can only imagine what happens in there. This is systematic rape. And one of the boys who we loved, his sister was going to be married, so what did we do? We went out there late one night and busted her out, and she got in my car. And as a 14-year-old girl jumped in the back of my car, and it opens the movie. Man, it's like we're in. The, this little girl jumps in the back of my car, and as I'm driving across state boundaries, I think this is probably legal. <laughs> and she lived with me. She lived with me while the police and the church and her parents were looking for her. Um, so yeah, I threw myself into that world for a long time. And did you keep your day job during those two years? Um, you know, I occasionally do some commercials, but I have to say like, I, I took a financial hit. It was a serious financial hit for a while. So you really were li living and breathing this five to seven hour, uh, days a week for two years, basically? I mean, you know, you, we would film often. We'd drive down to St. George and we'd film. And in between, we were trying to sell it. We would cut trailers, we'd cut teasers, and we'd take it out. We'd try and sell it, we'd take meetings, we'd try and raise money. I did raise a little bit of money here and there, but it wasn't like we were making money off of it. I mean, we were really living cheap, but I, we loved this story, and we just had to keep telling it. And, and we, you know, this, this run-and-gun feeling to it, and, and the film, you know, I, I won't say the film is beautiful. It's not. It's not a gorgeous-looking film. Uh, but I never, uh, we, we, we compromised on beauty in order to tell a great story. Like we were just hanging out with the kids. We'd just be sitting there talking. We'd be, you know, in the backyard or whatever. And I'd just have the camera sitting next to me. And they'd start talking about, oh, my dad beat me or my dad. And I would just slowly raise the camera up and press it, you know, and just film. And there's a great scene in the film where Joe is sitting by the pool and he talks about how his dad beat the shit out of him. And like, if I'd have said, wait, hold on, let me get this tripod. Let me put a mic on you. Let me set up the boom pole. The moment would, <laughs> would have been gone. It would have been over. So we, we never set up a boom pole. We never had another DP shoot. It was just us. We didn't set up lights. Like there were no lights, like we just filmed. And, and because of that, and because we ingrained ourselves in that world, um, we were able to get stuff that nobody else would have. That was kind of an artistic choice. Totally. And a choice totally constrained by, yeah. by resources. But. But, but I also believe the same thing now. I think, you know, financial or not, I, I prefer smaller crews. I prefer intimacy. You know, I prefer quiet and talking to someone instead of the, uh, the strangeness of there's a camera there and a camera there and... You know, let's check the sound. Rachel, one of our, our current viewers, uh, she writes, I'm watching it as soon as this is over. Nice. So we posted a link to uh, the IMDb uh, article on Sons of Perdition. Thanks, and Rachel. Rachel, uh, Tyler's grateful for your fandom. And everyone else, check out. I, I can say that I saw Sons of Perdition in the Logan screening. You sure did. That's you, where I first met you. Yeah, you did the Logan screening yeah. at that art, art house that... Uh -huh that since is defunct. Um, 
And I really loved it. I thought it was a really powerful story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's neat. The film took years uh, of my life. <laughs> and <laughs> Jenny and I just kept doing it. I mean, we just, we just kept making it and just kept making sure it was good. And there were a lot of times when we could have finished and said, oh, we're done now. And, but we just made sure that it was the best film we could possibly make. Is it flawed? Yeah, it is. Um, but it's your first. I mean, it's a gorgeous, so beautiful So did you film. win awards for it? Yeah. So um, we eventually raised some money and uh, Impact Partners came on and then the BBC bought some of it. The BBC loved it. They changed the title to Leaving the Cult. And it still plays in Britain. Those Brits, they love us crazy Americans, man. <laughs> they love it. Uh, and it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. That's and a big deal. It was huge. To get into Tribeca. It was huge yeah. at the time. And we we wanted to get into Sundance, but we just didn't finish the film in time. We just couldn't get it finished. So we played at Tribeca. It sold out all five screenings in an hour. And then it, they added another screening and it sold out. So it was, a, I mean, it was an amazing moment. It was an amazing experience to have your first film be such a big film. Um, you know, Robert De Niro, the head of the festival, got up and said it was his favorite film from the festival. And we had this huge screening and we did a Kickstarter and we, we had the kids, the polygamous kids, raised in this small little town. We took them out to New York City. And so here we are, these little kids from a small town. And I remember, I remember we drove out to, uh, we, we flew out to New York and we got in a cab. And I had like three polyg kids with me in this cab. And like, you know, New York, it's like, it's loud and it's people and crazy and there's buildings and we're driving in this cab and I remember like these polygamous kids are sitting next to me and uh the taxi driver was of I don't know of Indian descent or something or Pakistani or whatever and someone cut him off and like I don't know how much I want to profane on your show but it just became this volley back and forth of just f you f you f you and he just started making up words I mean it was just this like cussing back and forth it was just almost like tennis match of profanity back and forth of almost like they just kept going where they just had to make up swear words i wish i could say it but i won't and i looked over at these kids who were like these fresh-faced young little polygamous kids and they're just in shock like they'd never <laughs> never seen anything like this and we took them out to new york and they had a great time they became celebrities out there they had they got you know they we got a hairstyle donated and we got like clothes donated and they just became these, they just got, they became loved. Um, and the film played very, very well. And then, okay. So just in answer only to the extent you're comfortable. So when, it, when you are able to make a doc that, that gets entered into Tribeca that, you know, gets bought up by BBC and other places, does that mean you recoup none of your expenses, some of the expenses, all of the expenses, but <laughs> no profit? Like, give give people a realistic sense for, you know, an out of the gate successful doc. What what realistically you're able to recoup in terms of what you put into it? Well, you know, we made that for as little money as we could, uh, it, and um, you know, we didn't really take much of a salary while we were making it. I was still we were scraping, and occasionally I do commercials here and there. Uh, Jenny was teaching at the U, so she'd literally have to fly home to teach and then fly back to New York. We did the editing there. Uh, so what typically happens at that point, and we had the BBC come aboard, so they bought a territory, and then Oprah Network um, purchased it, and they paid uh, you know a decent amount for it, and um, they basically took a lot of the rights. Uh, now, it didn't mean we got whole. We then did a theatrical um, and we played at festivals all over the world. I mean, I traveled the world after that. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to get into the film industry was because I wanted to travel on someone else's dime. And man, the places I've seen, the places I've been, I have been everywhere. So just with that movie, movie alone, how many just cities that movie, do you think oh you... Oh, God, everything from Brazil like to... 20 cities? To, I mean, we played in Ireland. We played in in uh, England. We played in Italy. We who's played paying in for all this Prague. travel? We, they are. Who? Festivals. Oprah? Oh, festivals. Festivals. Pay filmmakers to come. Dude, the festival oh. circuit, if you make a film and it does well and you are young enough and want to do it, festivals are amazing. 
there are these, and you've been to one, Sundance, but there are festivals all over the world. Big, big cities, small cities. Is Sundance top three? Oh, easy. Yeah, okay, Sundance okay. is a big festival. It's Cannes and Tribeca. And Toronto's Sun big. Tribeca's now starting to be really big. Okay. Um, they've got a great lineup this year. Uh, almost, I think, better than Sundance, mm -hmm. I'll say. I have a short film at Tribeca this year. But, nice. Uh, uh, they've got, a, and I've had f all four of my films, four films, five films play at Tribeca, premiere at Tribeca. Uh, but man, you, I mean, you know, like they'll, they'll fly you in and these film festivals, you, they fly in filmmakers and they're all these like-minded young filmmakers coming in and we're all staying in the same hotel and showing films. It's the best experience. It's really great. So yeah, I traveled all over the world with the festival, both Jenny and I, um, with that film rather sons of perdition and the film still had a life. Uh, it helped a lot of polygamous kids, um, uh, I worked with the Texas Attorney General and the Texas Rangers to build a case against Warren Jeffs. Uh, worked with them very closely, and they held interviews in my home uh, to find witnesses who would testify. And they eventually found one who would testify against Warren, and they put him away. So, I'm, if there's anything I've done well, it's or done I've done good in my life. It's that I helped put Warren Jeffs in jail. That's great. That's exciting. Okay, so how'd you go from Sons of Perdition to An Honest Liar? Well, I worked really hard after that film. You know, you put a lot of energy and effort into making sure it's done right and it's theatrical and you travel around with the festivals and you promote it. And the age-old question in any filmmaker or any artist who's done anything large, that damned question that everyone asks you immediately after is, well, what are you going to do next? What next? Now what are you going to do? And I didn't know. I had no idea what I was going to do. I just, you know... It figuratively had a child and I wanted to help raise it a little bit. I wanted the film to get out and it played and it played and it played and it was wonderful. We played all over the world and then it played on the Oprah network and then that was it. Like it was literally like this. Everyone wants to see this film and it was so amazing and I was getting all kinds of press and all kinds of great stuff and then one day it played on TV and that was it. Like literally just like it was this post-mortem depression of I don't have a film I'm making and I don't uh, I don't have a film to promote anymore. And as an artist, man, the worst thing to have is not another project. Like to not be making or promoting a film sucks. And you like to come off this high where you're, you, you're showing this film to people and people took to it. I mean, it really affected people. It really helped a lot of people. And it was our story as people who had left the faith uh, because, you know, these boys had left the church or they'd been kicked out of Colorado City. It's one thing to leave Colorado City. It's another thing to leave it in your mind. When when you're 15 years old and you're told you're going to hell, I mean, that's a hard thing to reconcile. And that was my experience in many ways, leaving the faith. When I left the faith, it was difficult and it was time consuming and it was exhausting. It wasn't a weekend whim. And I know I walked out of that church, but I it took years to reconcile and to become a better person and to realize that I'm okay and I'm a, you know, this is the right decision for me. Um, so I, you know, I had this great experience making this film and showing this film and then all of a sudden one day it's over and you have to make another movie and I didn't know what to make. I had no idea. I have to pause you. Uh, <laughs> Don Garrett is tuning in. Oh, Don's a good cat. And Don says some of the best years of my life Living in a rundown, crappy house at Sundance with Tyler Meesum. Love you, Meesum. What so. a good guy. Don's a great cat. We we did we lived in that house together, and he was a badass. He he was a great guy. And Brian is asking, did the kids get paid to be in the movie? No, no, they didn't. Um, I mean, they they had a lot of meals on us, uh, but they never got paid. It's kind of ethically, it's not ethical to pay your subjects. In the doc world. In the doc world. Um, you know, did we help them? Yeah. I mean, they got m more than money. And afterwards, they traveled the world as well. Yeah, it's I also mean, they, like they a life. All over the place. You feel like your life is worth something if you've been in a major motion picture. You would think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think I'd want my 15 through 17 year old <laughs> self to be filmed, but hmm. they, they have this video diary of what it was like. Uh, to have gone through that. Well, I think for many, it it allows them to take something very difficult and painful 
and convert it into something meaningful that can help a lot of people. Instead of yeah. just sitting with sadness, you convert that difficulty and sadness into something that helps others. That can be a great gift. And I think they recognize that. You know, it was for sometimes for the boys, it was very difficult to have, you know, at some moments they felt exploited a little bit and it further ostracized them from their family and community that was still in the community in the crick. But I think they recognized that they had a, a, uh, a positive effect on a lot of people's lives. So, okay. So how'd you go from no film to an honest liar? <laughs> Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't really make money off an honest liar. We made very little and you know, the money still comes in oddly enough, but I was still pretty poor at the time. Wait, off an honest liar or off of Sons of Perdition? I'm sorry, Sons of Perdition. Okay. Okay. Um, it's nice to know you listen and catch those little things. Well, I don't know. I just want to make sure I wasn't losing you. No, it's good. Okay. No, it's good. Uh, and a friend of mine, Thomas Guthrie said, dude, you should make a film about this guy, James Randi. And uh, James Randi. No, no, no. Who oh, his name you? is Thomas Guthrie. He's okay. a good friend of mine. Okay. He lives here in Salt Lake. This was right. What year? What year was this? Uh, I should look at your IMDb. 2010. Okay, is yeah. It was. And it seems like all the the new atheists were kind of raging. Yeah. I mean, this was Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, right. Richard Dawkins, and James Randi was being swept up in this sort of secular anti-religion right. he was like being paraded around a lot of these conferences as a skeptic and that's how i learned about him right yeah. um yeah and i hadn't i didn't know anything about james randy yeah uh but it took me about a half an hour of research to go oh my goodness this man is amazing You've so been on the tonight show with johnny carson oh, right? he's all over the place yeah, yeah. so Tell our listeners a little bit about so james randy is james the amazing randy and James Randi was a world-famous magician and escape artist, probably the best since Houdini. And he uh, made a living escaping and doing magic so throughout like being the country. So like chained upside down in a water vault and then I, I mean, breaking out of a straight jacket with the, you know, that sort of thing, right? Dude would be locked in a co coffin underwater. He'd encase himself in ice. He'd straight jacket off of cranes. I mean, just crazy. Wasn't there like a... a, a Niagara Falls kind of thing. Yeah, he escaped uh, from a straight jacket over Niagara Falls. He <laughs> broke Houdini's record. You know, and, he, and, and he's just like this really witty, funny, interesting guy. And then at some super point... Super short, right? Super short. Yeah. And smart as hell. And at one point, James Randi... I mean, you can't escape from straight jackets your whole life. <laughs> but he'd always had this uh, hate of deceit. He always hated to see people who use the tricks of magic, something that he loved, for deception. So he always saw, you know, psychics and faith healers and spoon benders uh, using magic tricks, something that he loved, but in order to, you know, bilk a, uh, a uh, unwitting audience. And so he decided to fight it, much like Houdini did prior to him. He decided to spend his life trying to debunk these individuals. And him being a magician, someone who is uh, a well-versed in foolery and chicanery and flim-flam, he was able to see their tricks. He was able to understand. It's, you know, it takes a crook, it takes a thief to catch a thief. So he spent his life trying to debunk these individuals. Um, and he's, he's still alive. He's 88. Uh, and I spent about an hour, I researched him and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe no one's made a film about this gentleman. Can I just say, you, you don't know until you watch the film, the important work he was doing because growing up in the eighties, these charlatans would claim to heal people of their cancer. Yeah. They would claim to like operate on people. They would, people would give their life savings to these people. And then there are these clowns who would run around on TV as like psychics and again, make tons of money and probably sleep with crazy amounts of people, miss, you know, abusing people's trust. Yeah. And so it wasn't just like showmanship. He was actually doing a really important public service of helping people not lose their life savings and be fooled. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and you know, the, the late 70s and 80s was this very strange period of pseudoscience and television and media was rife with it you remember like that's incredible and arthur c clark's world of strange powers and you know it was full of crystals and ufos and cults 
And, you know, he was this one soul guy fighting it. And faith healers, these these charlatan faith healers. And he would spend his life uh, going after these individuals and trying to prove them wrong. And I, I, I've always said, if you can find someone who's passionate about what they do and they do something a little bit different than the norm, you've got a good subject for a story. And James Randi was one of those guys who was just passionate and spent his entire life dedicated to this service that he felt was the right thing to do and was the right thing to do. I mean, there are people, there were faith healers taking money from elderly. There were, you know, spoon benders and psychics who were deceiving individuals and taking them out of money and giving them false hope. And his job was to prove them wrong and do it through a scientific uh, structured manner. And by this point, you've already alluded to some emerging themes that that sort of developed into your filmmaking. So how did how did James Randi's story fit into the themes that were emerging as in the types of films you wanted to make? Well, I I'm, I'm very interested in deception. Right. Uh, I'm very interested in those who deceive, and I think coming from a Mormon background, and feeling in essence that I I'd been deceived, and not only had I been deceived, but I'd spent some time deceiving unknowingly. And uh, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated with the aspect of overlooking demonstrative truths that are placed in front of you in order to serve your own agenda. And when I saw James Randi, a man who has spent his life trying to expose deception, I thought, what a, what a great story. Uh, so, and I was also, you know, I was also at the time uh, questioning. Now, now, by this time, personally, I had had my name taken off the records. I had done that in 2004 when the church uh, came out against gay uh, marriage here in the state of Utah. And this was well before Prop 8. I can't remember what it was called. Prop 4, I think, here in the state of Utah. And I had my name uh, taken off the records of the church in an act of political defiance and that was the purpose and reason why I did it my little brother is gay and I decided I needed to you know let them know <laughs> that what they were doing and affecting people's lives I don't need to go on this you know uh, wasn't something I supported um, so I had fully left the faith I was fully out of it but at this time I was also questioning uh, you know the greater self what is out there what is this belief uh, and here's an avowed atheist. And I was wondering, you know, is that a road I go down? So I reached out to James Randi and I sent him a copy of Sons of Perdition and they vetted me for about six months. Uh, and I kept going back and I kept going back and I kept being a damn persistent pest. And finally they said, yeah, let's do it. So I, uh, I was at a film festival and I met a gentleman by the name of Justin Weinstein and he had come off a film called Being Elmo where he was the... Uh, that was a big movie. That was a great movie. Yeah. Yeah, and he had, he'd written and edited that. And we met at this festival, and he knew, Jay, he knew of James Randi, and we totally sat down. We had dinner that night, and we talked about it. And like within an hour, I said, let's do it. Let's do it together. And it's, you know, and then we spent the next two and a half years of our life, you know, on the road together making this project. It was really strange that we like, within an hour, we said, let's do it. And he's, you know, he's a New York guy. He's very different from, you know, my West Coast attitude. It worked out really well. But we just dove into making this film about James the Amazing Randy. And uh, I don't want to give it away. This is definitely a movie where there's some surprise twists and turns that I'm not going to want to give away. But it's a powerful movie. And it's nice. how might, what, what might you tell sort of a, a liberal or progressive or even a questioning or post-Mormon why this movie might be relevant to them. Well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to select. I, look, I, 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 I don't. Well, just since that's our audience. Of course. I, but, I, I, you know, I try not to make films that, that cater to appeal. one. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there were a lot of Mormon individuals who wouldn't watch Sons of Perdition because they felt that it might target their, um, their uh, beliefs. And we actually tried very hard not to discredit the Mormon faith or any faith in general. Now, I'm not going to say anything good about the FLDS. And I also have 
some uh, pretty strong beliefs about polygamy in general that I don't care for. Um, but we, we went out of our way to make sure that we weren't, um, you know, trying to, uh, to be anti. Uh, now, uh, An Honest Liar follows James Randi, who is gay and has a partner. And the film, I mean, it doesn't really even touch on religion. It, it really, really doesn't. What it does do is it teaches you to be a little more aware that there's always someone out there who's going to tell you they have powers, psychic powers, that they believe one thing and that you should believe this way. And all James Randi is doing is just look a little bit deeper, spend a little more time and try and investigate whether or not uh, this is true and it's, it's right for you. So, you know, it, it's by no means uh, against faith. Um, but what it does do, I think, A, it's a beautiful love story. I mean, I started making a movie about uh, an old gay magician. What I, what I was lucky to do was tell this beautiful, heartwarming love story about this very important and beautiful couple that I just love. Um, and I got to love James Randi and his partner, Davey, Jose. Um, I just, you know, and like the boys, I just love these people. Like you live with them, you learn about them. You, you know, like James Randi turned over everything, like his journals and his pictures and his tax returns, like boxes full of stuff and old VHS tapes. He'd recorded every television appearance he's on. And here I am like delving into this man's 85 years life and learning about him. And it's such a strange experience to like really know everything about an individual that you don't, you know, you're not married to, <laughs> you know, and just to, be, to, to love this person and to be with them and care for them. And as a doc maker, that's one of the best, that's one of my joys, like to really, to be able to just um, know someone and care about them and talk to them and feel them. Uh, it's, uh, that's my favorite part. Now there's a part, if I'm remembering the movie, there's a part of it where you get the sense that maybe he regrets having made the movie and <laughs> some stuff comes out where maybe, maybe the, you know, black hat, white hat dichotomy becomes a little bit gray where you're like, Whoa, okay. Maybe he's not always amazing all the yeah. time. Uh. What was that like? Was that a harrowing <laughs> part of your relationship where you've gotten to know him? He's trusted you. And then all of a sudden something comes out where he's like, uncomfortable deeply uncomfortable um opening yourself up to a person with a camera who lives in your home and hangs around for a while is is uh is frightening uh and james randy lived his life on the stage and in front of the camera so you know when when we'd show up and we'd film him he would be the the amazing randy and he'd put on a show and he'd be funny and he'd be witty and he'd wacky and he'd tell jokes. And, but, um, you know, when you go over to someone's house the first time, they clean up. You know, they bring out cookies. Or they clean up. When you go over to someone's house the 10th time, they could give a shit. They don't care. You know what I mean? And that, as a doc maker, that's where you want to get. You want to get to a point where they feel so comfortable around you that they open, they let their guard down. So it took us a year and a half of the amazing Randy before we were able to see James Randy. And Not long. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he was, look, when we first met him, he said, I'll do this under one condition, warts and all. You show all my issues, you show all the problems. And of course, as a doc maker, that's what you want to hear because we, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make a puff piece. I don't want to show one side. I don't want to make a commercial for James the Amazing Randy. Um, and, and, and the film does, it does show some of his issues and so some of his problems. Uh, but after a while, he let down his guard and he forgot we were there and he cried and he was scared. And something happened while we were filming the movie without giving too much away. Something happened while we were making the movie that spun the entire direction of the film in a different area. I mean, it really, to the, to the tune where the FBI showed up, let's just say that. And... Fortunately, it was within the context and theme of the film itself, deception, and we continued to follow that story, and they continued bravely enough to let us stay and be a part of this story. Uh, now, I don't know if I'd want someone following me around all the time, 
And I don't think you'd want it either. Would you do <laughs> in your house staying around? No, no. In fact, I don't know if you recall, but when you were first um, threatened with disfellowship or excommunication, I sent you an email and I said, John, I want to tell the story. I want to follow you. Do you remember what, what you did? What did I say? Nothing. You didn't send back anything. Oh, you know what? Uh, and I don't blame you. I don't no, blame no, no, you. no. I, I actually feel, I'm sure that I, there are things about my life that, that my listeners don't know and that my family would want listeners to know. Um, but there's little that I wouldn't want them to know. That was a super sensitive time mm -hmm. for my wife and kids. Margie did not want uh, our family to be drugged through a very public thing. So I I forgot about that, and I'm really sorry. Don't don't be. I but totally that get would, it. That would have been Margie and the kids saying nope. no, no effing way. <laughs> no, nope. and I, I don't I don't blame. I would have liked that actually. I, yeah. It would have been a great story. Um, but I'm sad uh, that didn't happen. No, 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 no. It, it, you know, in order to do this kind of thing, it takes commitment and it takes time and effort. And and again, I'm not coming in for a weekend. I would have been on your front door every day. Oh, Margie would have would, hated that. Right. And Margie's amazing. She's <laughs> wonderful. Um, and it would have been a great story. But again, it's fine. Uh, but it does show like if someone came and said, I want to follow you and make a documentary about you. Because you, you look, James Randi lived an amazing life an amazing life and his his story was in our hands and Justin and I had the power to kind of make him look like an asshole or make him look like a hero and that's scary in some ways um it it, 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 it you know to be able to like have someone's public fate in your hands and to be truthful to that uh is a responsibility and to be able to have someone trust you enough to be able to open up your life and story it's that's something i don't know if i'd do so kudos to anyone who's brave enough to be able to do that yeah i'll just to my audience i was also at the screening doug fabrizio did a screening yeah. of an honest liar uh -huh. downtown salt lake i was able to go to that yeah freaking love the movie it's on netflix right now go see an honest go see sons of perdition and then do a back-to-back -back Honest Liar after Sons of Perdition. Tyler Film Festival. Yeah, Tyler Just. Film Festival. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a great movie. Highly recommend it. I showed it to my son. He loved it. Um, really good stuff. Thanks. And you were you were helpful in that. You know that, right? You introduced me to a gentleman who, uh, a wonderful guy who helped, uh, help uh, initially gave us an angel investment and able to get it off the ground. So that was your name's in the credit, man. Shout out to my, my buddy Tyson. Okay, I didn't know if I should say uh, his I'll name say it. I can say Tyson's it. rad. He was such <laughs> a good cat and such a fan of the film. Tyson's great. Dude sold his Lamborghini or his car. I don't know if it was Lamborghini. Dude sold his car and able to help fund our film. I mean, that like that kind of thing, to be able to tell a story, uh, to be able to believe in a filmmaker in order to want to tell a story at the beginning of it, man, kudos to him. He's a good cat. And, and if we get in trouble, we'll, we'll pull this out of the offline version. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if, if Tyson doesn't uh, like that. But it, it played very well. It premiered at Tribeca. Uh, it opened uh, very, very well. It was uh, played all over the world, played at festivals, uh, had a nice theatrical run, was a New York Times critics pick, um, got a 97% Rotten Tomatoes score. It, uh, it did very, very well. I'm insanely proud of that film. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, James Randi is an amazing character, and I'm fortunate to be able to tell that story. I was very lucky to be able to dedicate time and effort and energy to be able to tell a story that I love and follow someone that I love. But B, um, and Justin, my directing partner, was just amazing. Like, him and I, I, again, like, he's this New York tough guy, and I'm this laid-back dude. And, you know, I wanted to make this goofy film about a crazy magician. And he wanted to make this deep, dark deception film with secrets in it. And we clashed, man. We fought. We like, I mean, like, like F you fights, screaming <laughs> in hotel rooms in Florida. And it, it was only because we loved this project so much. And we would fight and fight and fight about the cuts or cut, fight about something. And then, like, when it fixed, we'd get it. Like, immediately, we'd both go, oh, we did it. That's it. You know, and, and that feeling you get. When you're editing a film and you have hundreds of hours of footage and you're trying to put it together, and this took a year and a half to edit, 
uh, and you're putting it together and you're trying to figure out how this is going to work and how the scene's going to work and how am I going to make it work and is, am I telling the story too early and how am I going to keep this secret and how am I going to, and you're just, you, you, you just can't figure it out and you're fighting and you're hating it and then one day you get it and one day it just clicks and you go, my God, let's try this and it works. It's this moment where it's like, you know, there's rare times for us to celebrate. You know, we don't get a chance. We don't kick field goals in the World Cup or goals in the World Cup. We don't kick field goals in the Super Bowl. But these, those moments when you figured out a story problem and you figured it out because you worked really hard at it and it clicks, that's like this beautiful moment. Like that, that's these moments that as an artist are few and far between. But man, they, when they come, they just feel great. I just heard you say a year and a half in editing like that. I, I would think the shooting would be six months and then the editing would be two months and you'd have pa. a movie made. It, but what's it? The, the story is made in the edit. Uh, documentary editors are the unsung heroes of the film world. These people take copious amounts of footage and craft and create a story uh, in, in working with the directors. And, uh, you know, there's so many ways you can tell a story. There's no one way. Even though this was basically a historical retelling of an individual uh, paired with archival footage, of, or uh, sorry, paired with verite footage of something that's happening, there is ways to tell that story. And um, what I'm most proud of that Justin and I never compromised uh, is the film flawless? No, of course it's not. Are there errors? Yeah. But is there anything that I look at and say, we didn't work as hard as we could to make sure it was great. We didn't stay up late. We didn't work nights and weekends to make sure it was perfect. We didn't, you know, after it premiered at Tribeca, go back and edit the film again because we saw things we didn't like. That's, that's what makes me happy is the effort, the continued effort and I watch films and I see films and I'm like, man, if they just spent another three or four months editing, it'd be great. But they turned their paper in too early. Uh, and and if there's one thing I'm, I'm proud of us for doing is not doing that. We worked until it was perfect. And I can watch that film and go, yeah, I did everything I could to make sure it was as good as possible. So you left it all on the field, so to speak. I guess so. I guess <laughs> so. But you know, like I don't, th that's why I'm not prolific, John. I... I, it takes me years to make movies, years and years and years, because A, I become entrenched in the story, and B, uh, I, I want to make sure that, I, that my art hangs in museums and not coffee shops. That's a pretentious statement, isn't it? <laughs> totally pretentious. <laughs> no, that's great. A um, couple comments from our listeners. Brian writes, so brilliant. I admire your artistry and willingness to take risks to tell important stories. Thanks for sharing your gift. Cheers. Cheers. And then Delane writes, hey, I know this guy way back with Telos Dave Nibley days. Yeah. Nice to see you, Tyler. Yeah, that, that was the company in Provo. And Dave Nibley was a, a partner in it. So, yeah. All right. So uh, you had a second award-winning film. Are people still listening after? What are we even talking for? Yeah, like no, a, no. I mean, like you know, four this, hours? What are we? All my interviews find their audience. I uh, guess so. I listened to seven and a half hours of Brett Metcalf. So <laughs> You've done your time. <laughs> yes, and we'll talk about why he watched Brett Metcalf oh, in a minute. Just teasing. <laughs> just teasing. Teasing the heck out of this.